Welcome back, everyone, to episode number 30 of the Beginner to Master Free Run. Today is going to be a special one. I'm currently on a 97 game win streak, rated 1374. So hopefully, I can break 100 wins today. Uh, but you never know, competition is getting stronger. So we shall see. And before we get to the chess, I do want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is BetterHelp. Chess can be a lot like life. We strategize, we plan, but sometimes unexpected challenges will come up. One day, you might feel like a grandmaster checkmating everyone in your path. The next day, you might be on full tilt, getting mated by a pawn. It's important to note that life is not a solitary game. If you're feeling stuck, therapy can really help. Whether it's managing anxiety or coping with your emotions after a bad blunder, talking with a professional can help improve your mental well-being on and off the chessboard. And this is where BetterHelp comes in. They're an online platform that connects you with a licensed therapist who's trained to listen and give you helpful advice based on your specific needs. To get started, you can use my link, betterhelp.com slash ericrosen, answer a few questions, and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist, usually within 48 hours. You can do it all from your phone or computer via video chat, phone call, or messaging. It's the easiest way to start talking to a therapist. So again, if you want to sign up, click the link in the video description, betterhelp.com slash ericrosen to get a special discount off your first month of BetterHelp and join the over 4 million people who have used BetterHelp to live a happier, healthier life. Now let's get back to the chess. So let's hop into the first game. Playing old piano, 97. And I'll play e4. And we'll go for... Do I go for an Italian or a Ponziani? Opponent's name is uh, has piano in it. Let's go for uh, the Ponziani. Maybe Ponziani can be anagrammed into piano in some way. Um, d5 is one of the best moves. Maybe the best move. It's what I played in a previous episode from the black side. Uh, against this move, I like to play queen a4 which is a tricky response to pin the knight and basically attacking the pawn on e5. And a lot of players will get to this position and not know what to do with black. Black takes, which looks natural, but I believe that's already a pretty big mistake because now I'm hitting the knight, which is pinned. I'm also threatening to win the pawn on e4. So black has a, a few issues here. Bishop d7. So that does break the pin. And now I guess it's a question. Do I want to take the pawn on e4 right away? I can also take the bishop and then take the pawn. It's maybe a safer approach because if I take the pawn first, there's queen e7 and then my knight's pinned and attacked. So let's go ahead and take the bishop and then take the pawn with check. So I win a pawn, but I've violated some principles moving the queen twice in the opening. My minor pieces are not uh, exactly developed, so there's still some work to do. Um, I mean, d4 is definitely a very natural move here. I guess it's a question if I want to play d4 or develop the bishop and then later play d4. It might not matter so much. Uh, perhaps d4 is a little bit more flexible. I'll start with d4. Because I'm not actually sure if I want to put the bishop on like d3, c4, b5, or even e2 in some cases. So black attacks my queen. I'm going to have to move the queen again. I could drop back to c2. Looks safe and solid. And queen f3 is also perhaps a little bit more active. And it's really a question where my queen can be, where it can't be kicked around further. I actually like f3 a bit more than queen c2. Because the queen can't really be attacked here so easily. And it exerts pressure against box position, even though f5 is defended and yeah, I can't win anything on the diagonal just yet. Um, it's looking comfortable for white. Okay, so now it's a decision how to develop. 
mean, Bach probably wants to play rook e8 next and try and exploit my king. So bishop d3 looks very natural. Bishop b5 is perhaps a bit more active, creating the pin. Yeah, with bishop d3, I'm actually a little bit concerned about knight e5, and then takes, and then takes. Maybe it's not a huge concern, but it just seems like the bishop's not doing much here, because there's g6, and f5 is very well defended. So I'll play bishop b5. Yeah, more active, preparing to castle. Now, if I do castle kingside, then it could lead into a sharper game. Uh, Bach plays queen e6 check, which maybe I should have anticipated. But looks like here I can develop and block the check. And f4 is not coming. I mean, maybe f4 is playable. I'd sack a pawn, then knight d5, but I think that would be okay. Wow, g5. So Bach going very aggressive here, uh, threatening to essentially win the bishop with pawn f4. And it's actually looking less attractive to castle because Black is already pawn storming. I mean, maybe I could play queen e2, try and trade queens. Yeah, g5 is a good move. Like if I castle and then f4 and then I have to retreat, not so pretty. Queen e2 might be the way to go here. And it doesn't feel that great moving my queen so many times early on in the game. But at least now I break the pin. Okay, black is keeping initiative, attacking the pawn on g2. If I castle, I think maybe now I should castle. Bishop on b5 is defended. And black is playing well for having lost a pawn in the opening, getting a lot of initiative here. So now, I mean, the easy move is bishop d2, but I could also start with bishop c4. It's really a question if I want to attack the queen right away. I think I'll start with bishop d2. Although is Bach wanting to play f3? Okay, taking some time here. Bishop d2, f3, and if I take, I lose my bishop. If I take with pawn, then my king's a bit more exposed. So bishop c4 first. Perhaps it's a safer move. Let's go for this. Yeah, getting a little bit low on time. Already below five minutes. But just trying to stabilize here. I mean, the queen has a few options between f5, d6, and a5. Or d7. Although if it moves to d7, there's a cool tactic. I can take, and then take, and then pin. So the queen would be unleashed to support the bishop on e6. So queen d6 is played. Yeah, now I'll save the bishop. And probably what I want to do... I was going to say I want to trade queens. I mean, black is also allowing me to take the pawn with check. But then after king b8, it should be fine, because then I can take on f4. But I'm thinking that it might be just simpler to play queen e6 first, force a queen trade, and then I'll win the f and or g pawn. Yeah, let's go for this. Queen takes g4 is probably completely fine there. But this is just a bit more forcing. If king b8, I can take and then take. And if takes, I take. And then I'll have a choice which pawn to capture. I'll be checking the king there. So looks like I can kind of breathe a sigh of relief that my uh, my king is going to be safe. Like Especially when queens get uh, traded. Won't have to worry about any mating attack. So I'll take on d6. 
I think Black got a little bit too feisty there playing g4. Perhaps should have taken a bit more time to figure out a better option. But the game continues. Uh, knight g6 attacks a bishop. Bishop g3 looks solid. I kind of like the move bishop g5. So I'm not only attacking the rook, I'm threatening to play bishop f6 to trap the rook on h8. Bishops can be very powerful here. So bishop e7 was probably the best move. And now I'm happy to trade. And then complete development. So up two pawns. Uh, down on time, but it's a much easier position to play now. A knight g6. I might as well trade. Why not? Double blocks pawns. Going into the endgame. Yeah, this pawn storm doesn't really scare me too much. So, might as well double up on the e file. Let's play rook e3 first. There's some ideas of rook g3 to start targeting the double pawns. And the e file is the only file in the position with no pawns on it, so it's the only open file. Makes sense to put both rooks on. And then. Hopefully later invade Black's position. I mean, I can't access e7, but I mean, if the knight ever moves, then I can hopefully come in. And maybe I can provoke the knight to move with uh, b4, b5. Yeah, I'll start with b4. I should note here, if rook h8, looks like my h-pawn is hard to defend, but I have knight f1, a very solid move. Usually you see this move like earlier in the middle game as a nice defensive piece, but can also defend well in the end game. Okay, king d7. So I have rook g3. I like b5 though, kick away the knight. And yeah, now rook e5 attacking g5. Pressuring upon d5. If black plays rook g7, it keeps everything defended. Okay, well now I have a choice what to win. I'll take with check first. And then I can take on g5 next. It looks like I'm just cleaning up all the pawns, at least on the king side. Yeah, knight f4, just making sure, yeah, knight e2 is off limits, everything's still defended. So the biggest concern here is time, but okay, opponent gives me the knight, and this is still plenty of time to uh, convert the position. Defend the b5 pawn. And I can probably start thinking about creating a mating net. With the rooks coordinating. And go for rook g7. It's very common in the endgame. You want to look to put your rooks on the seventh rank if you're white. I'm trying to conceptualize a checkmate here. Like if I play this and then this and then this, that would be checkmate. Pawn and knight would create the wall on the fifth rank. But I'm really just trying to show no mercy, give black no chances here. Yeah, let's go for rook c7. And of course I could have taken the pawn, but I like the idea of bringing the knight in. And then the cool thing is, if I get to play this move and black moves here with the king, it would still be checkmate. Okay, well now the king wants to kind of slide into my territory. So I'll play a restricted move, rook e7. So both files are cut off. And sometimes this is the best way to work towards checkmate, is not to directly check the king, but simply to restrict the king. And now I believe it's made in two. And this is a fork. 
but I'm not interested in taking the rook. King d6, b rook, c d7. And um, yeah, that was a pretty hard fought game, especially like right after the opening. It felt like my opponent had like pretty good compensation for the pawn. Like g5 was played very quickly. I think it was a very strong move. And it took a lot of care to not let things crumble for white. Um, yeah, I was happy with queen e2 though. And then going forward, you can turn on the eval bar here. Engine says white is a little bit better. Uh, after f4, bishop c4. Yeah, just to show this tactic, queen d7, I can take on f4, threatening bishop e6. Would have been nice. So, yeah, queen d6 was a fine move. And then, yeah, g4 is just uh, a little bit too overextending for black. The top engine move is actually king b8, which looks a little bit slow, but it does get the king off this diagonal. And then maybe later black can build up the pawn storm with h5 and eventually g4. But uh, yeah, I think white is still in good shape here. Like, I could still force a queen trade with queen e6 and have the advantage. So uh, good game. Um, I guess one more lesson to take away from this game. If you're playing this line as black and you encounter queen d4, uh, black should not take the pawn on e4. The best move here is pawn f6. And I played this uh, pretty recently in this free run. I will link it below if you want to check out that game. But let's move on. Currently on 98 games in a row. Try and keep it going. Okay, playing Dragon 1967 Glamok from Serbia. And yeah, we'll keep playing some normal openings. Ooh, okay, we have we haven't seen this one in a while. This brings me back to uh what episode one or two? Hopefully I can still remember how to not lose in four moves. Of course, white wants to checkmate, so the best move here is to play g6. Chase away the queen. It was very important to defend the pawn first before playing g6. White is still threatening mate, so I will develop and defend. Queen supports knight. And white plays knight e2. Okay, so, I mean, this is playable for white, even though white's kind of violated some opening principle. Uh, what I can do from here is just keep developing. Bishop g7. Might as well fiend keto, given I've already played g6. And I'll play d6. Very possibly looking to play bishop g4. So h3 is a useful move, uh, preventing the bishop from coming in. And meanwhile, yeah, white maybe wants to play bishop g5 to pin my knight. But if that happens, I don't think I'm like so scared. I can always play h6. So I guess it's a question like what my next few developing moves will be. And casting would make sense. Knight a5 comes to mind as like a useful way to trade knight for bishop. This move usually comes up in like uh, various Italian structures. I don't think the bishop can actually avoid the trade. Like a bishop b5, I play c6, bishop a4, b5, chase the bishop to b3, and then get the bishop pair. So, yeah, I think I'll play knight a5 right away. It's not the typical opening move, but yeah, might as well get rid of the bishop. And one of the benefits to just trading off the knight or removing it from c6 is later I can look to play c6 and d5. Um, I could play c6 right away, but let's just castle first. King safety first. And now I'll play c6. And not only am I threatening to play pawn d5, maybe at some point, but c6 also prevents the idea of like if white played bishop g5, uh, there would be no knight d5. So multi-purpose move. Uh, now it's a question, is white actually threatening to take the pawn on a7? I don't think white is. Like if white takes, then b6 is very likely to win the bishop. 
Likewise, if takes and then takes and then takes b6 again, the bishop should get stuck. So with the bishop on e3, I mean, d5 looks even more attractive. Now, we do have to count before playing this move, because there's three attackers. But I have three defenders, so pawn would be defended enough times. If I play this, there is bishop c5 hitting the rook, but I have rook e8. Yeah, let's go for d5. Trying to take over the center, gain some space. Yeah, and even though white played like a very common beginner like trick opening going for scholar's mate, uh, they're not really blundering so easily just yet. Um, but will they defend against the fork? They do. And bishop g5 is actually a quite useful move for white. Because white's pinning the knight and now threatening to take and then win the pawn. So... I probably don't want to advance the pawn because that allows knight e4. And then I'd actually be in trouble with my knight being pinned and attack three times. So bishop e6 looks pretty standard here. Developing and defending. And sometimes like having this pawn center, it can be a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, I, I control the space, I control the center. But there are times where the pawns can be targeted. But uh, yeah, the pawns are pretty well supported here. And now, probably just want to play h6 and see what white does with the bishop. And if white takes, I don't mind trading. If white moves back, then maybe I would consider playing g5. So now I have a choice whether to take with queen or bishop. If I take with queen, there's kind of a weird line. Now, white could maybe consider taking. And then if I take, trying to win the knight next move, there's 97 check. I'd have to move my king, white recaptures. But that should be very good for me, because I'm trapping the knight in the end. Also, maybe winning a pawn. So I guess it's a question... Like, do I want to take and provoke the queen trade, or do I want to keep queens on the board? I'm not actually sure. I think both moves are fine. I think I will take with the queen, just to simplify a bit. And if we go like into an endgame, then generally two bishops are much preferable over two knights. And there's not too many ways for white to avoid the queen trade. And queen e3 would get forked. Uh, there is queen g3, which maybe is the only way to avoid the queen trade. So white takes. Um, take back. Knight b5. Okay, interesting move. So white is not only pressuring the pawn, but if I move the pawn, there's knight c7 hitting the rook and bishop. I'd rather not allow knight c7. So, kind of like the idea of rook fc8. Play this quickly. Not only preventing knight c7, but also hitting the undefended pawn on c2. And I wouldn't mind the trade. Like, if takes and then takes and then takes, I'll take on c2 in the end. And now I can play a6. Attacking the knight. We see knight to d6. Wow, so the knight's attacking the rook and the pawn. Feels very close to trapping the knight. And if I attack it, then there's this, and then this, and then this. So I think I just want to move to defend the pawn. And actually with this move, the knight currently has nowhere safe to go. Like, there's eight legal knight moves. All of the squares are controlled. Okay, pawn f4, maybe trying to rescue the knight. But can I play rook d8 and trap the knight? Because takes and then takes. Oh, also, yeah, knight b5 maybe was possible there, because my a pawn was pinned. But after rook d8, 
Yeah, the A-pawn is no longer pinned, so B5 is not accessible for the knight. And pawn takes pawn would temporarily defend the knight, but after I take back, uh, looks like I will be winning a piece. Unless there is some resource I'm missing here. I mean, d4 attacks a bishop, but then I just take the knight. And white did open the f-file, but f7 is very well defended. So it's another case where I have a good position, up material, I just have to move quickly to convert the advantage. Uh, pawn d4. What diagonal do I want to keep the bishop on? Probably keep it in the center. This is a nice diagonal, restricting the knight. There might be some idea of doubling up rooks, and then this would set up the tactic of bishop h2. So if I get one more move, bishop h2 would deflect the king and then allow me to win more material. And if white plays rook f1 here, it would be the same tactic. Okay, so predicting the future be winning the rook for the bishop. It's a nice tactical pattern that uh, you don't see too frequently. So now I'm up a rook or a pawn, and now it's time to probably clean up. Okay, rook f2 is prevented, but I can play rook b1. And the plan is to, well, first not lose my bishop. Although, if I play this, then yeah, white defends a pawn. So I'll play king f7, defending these things with my king. And then if white plays this, I can attack the knight. Okay, now I can take the pawn. Might as well trade. Yeah, I was going to say, the plan is to win... Most of the pawns on the queen side, and then probably promote on the queen side. Yeah, now winning one of these pawns. Happy to trade off the, the final minor pieces. Now it's time to push. Put the rook on b6, just making sure the king can't cross the b-file. Okay, and white resigns. So, pretty clean game. Um, I mean, white played like pretty solidly out of the opening, and I think the main mistake this game was just putting the knight too deep in my territory. I mean, white was maybe slightly worse in this position, but um, yeah, maybe should have been aware of the danger here. And it's possible that, yeah, knight d6 was actually still the best move. But what white should have done here was realize I'm threatening to trap the knight and just move the knight back. And of course, like, I would not repeat the position three times because yeah, I'm playing for a win. But I'd probably end up playing rook d7 and eventually move the rook and kick the knight maybe back to a3, but at least it's uh, a bit more playable. White's not losing material here, and the game would go on. So this brings us to 99 wins in a row. Uh, this next game is going to be game number 100. Let's get into it. Playing TK Rook 84. I'll play e4. And... I mean, do I go for another Ponziani? I think I will. I mean, at this rating level, Ponziani is a very effective opening. Um, black playing, probably what's the most common move, knight f6. Can still play d4 here. And the general rule here is whatever pawn black takes, I can move forward and attack the knight. In this case, attacking the c6 knight. Um, there is a very tricky line here that a lot of like title players would play bishop c5, but knight e7 is a more common move, especially at this rating level. 
Um, now I can take the pawn on e5. So winning back the pawn. And black is falling into one of the most common traps in the Ponziani. Uh, d6, it's a very natural move, attacking the knight and preparing to develop the bishop. But um, it just walks into this move bishop to b5. And now things are about to get real good for white. After pawn c6, I can take. Um, I did put out a video a few years ago. I think it's one of my most viewed videos on YouTube that features this line. Um, but basically, yeah, what's happening is I'm having a triple orc attacking the king, rook, and knight. And I don't want to take the rook because then after takes, uh, I would lose the bishop. So it's just better to take the knight here. And after all said and done, white is up a minor piece, um, up a knight. Oh, also up a pawn too. So black is trying to win back something, attacking the bishop. Uh, I can castle here. I can also say, oh no, my bishop. If black takes it, there is rookie one. So black takes the bait. Oh no, black's queen. Yeah, life is very good now. Uh, let's keep developing. Oh, you know what though? I was just thinking that if I play bishop f4, black castles, I take the bishop, black can then play rook e8 skewering my queen to the back rank. So that's actually kind of tricky. Any way to like avoid that? Like maybe bishop g5 is better. Bishop g5 f6. I mean, I'd like to make it so black can't castle next move. So I'm gonna play h3. Although, okay, if I play h3, there's castling, takes, and then rook e8. Okay, then I take rook e1, king h2, rook c1. I'm probably just overthinking this. Yeah, I'm up a queen. Let's not overthink this too much. I'll still play h3. We'll see if black wants to castle and go into that line. Um, bishop e6. That's a solid move. Let's develop. So black will be able to castle. I'll develop the knight. And now... Now it's a matter of trying to convert the position, having an extra queen or rook. Um, might as well activate the queen. Let's play queen e4. Not too concerned yet about uh, x-ray vision on the e-file. And probably what my plan is um, eventually is to target the pawn on d6. It is an isolated pawn. Have ideas of queen d3, knight e4, rook d1. Like sometimes when you're up a lot of material like this, basic principles still apply of trying to optimize the pieces, look for weaknesses in the opponent's position. So very soon, yeah, the rook wants to come to play. So very soon, yeah, the rook wants to come into the game. Still deciding where the knight wants to go. Okay, rook b8. Attacking b2. I'll go for knight c4 here. Multi-purpose move. Defending b2, attacking d6. Okay, bishop b5. That's uh it's actually a nice move from black. Now, I can't really take on d6, because then there's takes, and then takes, and then takes. I really don't want to give back any material. So, I think I'll just play b3. Solid move. I do leave the pin, but the knight is over-defended now. And, okay, I'll play queen d5. It's actually hard for black to remove the queen from d5. Like, bishop c6 is not possible. I mean, maybe black should go for bishop d7. Black takes on c4. Always happy to trade, especially in cases like this. 
And I, I still have delayed moving the rook in, but I think it's very likely next move. Um, yeah, rook d1. I mean, black does have rook c8, so I might be losing the, the c-pawn, but I think I'll be winning either the, the d or a-pawn, maybe both. Okay, I'll take on d6. And it is nice having played h3 earlier, because uh, yeah, I don't have to worry about back rank mates. Unless the bishop somehow gets to this diagonal, then then I might have to worry a little bit. But yeah, for now everything is under control. Um, not easy for Bach to defend the a7 pawn. Yeah, let's take on a7. And yeah, now the strategy is probably just to march up the pawns in b4. Queen defends a2 from a distance, but also defends f2 from a distance. Oh, you know what? Did I miss... I may have missed something in the last move. Yeah, after rook c2, I could have played queen a8, queen e4, but I still have the same idea. Probably should have been a little bit more alert there. But now queen e4, and this is now a triple fork, and I'm just going to win the rook next move. So, I mean, do I want to take the pawn? I might as well. And actually, if g6, I don't take the rook. Uh, this is mate in a couple. King h8, bishop e5. Okay, a uh, pretty smooth game. Uh, that was game number 100 of the speedrun. And the Ponziani is still proving to be pretty effective. Um, yeah, my opponent just walked into pretty nasty trap here, bishop to b5. Uh, the better move in this position is knight to g6, and uh, this would be very playable. Black is preparing to develop the dark sword bishop. I would have taken, and then after takes, play bishop d3, I think is the main line. So uh, hopefully uh, a nice opening lesson for the viewers and for my opponent, but uh, I think we'll end it there. Thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciate all the kind words and feedback throughout the speed run. It will not be ending anytime soon. So stay tuned for the next one and I'll see you guys soon. Chess can be a lot like life. We strategize, we plan, but sometimes unexpected challenges will come up. There's a hair in my mouth. Unexpected challenge. <laughs>